From the people who brought you the assembly language programming game nobody asked for comes the electronic engineering game TIS fans asked for. The manual concept returns, only this time it's been expanded upon. While TIS only covered a few solid pages of material, Shenzhen has roughly 45 full-size sheets brimming with diagrams and explanations. Some of it useful, much of it not. It might seem as though a large part of the documentation is just fluff, but really that stuff acts as camouflage for the more important information, making you work to understand all the possibilities. Most of this is very much in line with the last game, just larger, but it's in the final pages where Shenzhen puts its own spin on the idea. Now, individual challenges can have their own unique documentation, which, at its best, immensely enhances the first stage of problem solving. This ties into Shenzhen's greatest strength. It's multifaceted in a similar way as Space Chem, but the challenge is more evenly distributed across its three layers. First, there's actually understanding the goal and what problems lie in the way of getting there. In Space Chem, this was invariably about turning one chemical into another by changing it around a bit, whereas Shenzhen's goals vary more from puzzle to puzzle. Sometimes it's about figuring out the most simplistic way to return the values on a given plot. Other times it's about arranging recipes into logical groupings. The better you can parse useful information from the provided material, the easier it'll be to implement your solution. For the second layer, you decide which components to use and where to place them. In Space Chem, this meant putting down reactors, which were the same size and mostly functioned similarly. In Shenzhen, there's a wider array of parts, each with unique pros and cons, connected by more versatile wiring arrangements. Lastly, there's the manipulation of the inputs and outputs. This is where most of Space Chem's complexity arose, and in this aspect it eclipses Shenzhen. Waldos can perform a huge number of varied tasks with plenty of tricks to discover, but the assembly of Shenzhen is no slouch either. Predication provides room for interesting challenges and optimizations. The point of that quick comparison wasn't to say that one game is necessarily better than the other, just to show where their weaknesses and strengths lie. Space Chem is mostly about what happens inside reactors, while Shenzhen is more broad. Individual microcontrollers don't have as much going on, but the other layers have more complexity to make up the difference. This spread of challenges means that, no matter what your strengths as an individual player are, there's likely some reasonably attainable way to improve any of your solutions. At least until you get to the really hard stuff, anyway. In the previous three games, those optimization metrics were always just objective information. Number of reactors, number of blocks, number of nodes. Shenzhen's equivalent is cost, which is arguably more appealing to work towards, but introduces a balancing aspect which didn't exist before. It's obvious that a simple logic gate should be cheaper than a microcontroller, both because it would be less costly to manufacture and because its inexpensiveness acts as an incentive for players to build solutions with them. Conversely, the relationship between microcontrollers is not so clear cut. The larger MC6000 costs 5 won, while two MC4000s cost 6. In some cases, the increased number of ports and accumulators provided by two smaller chips will be more valuable, but in many situations the MC6000 is the better choice all around. Parallelism isn't nearly as valuable in Shenzhen as it was in TIS since scores are no longer tallied based on cycles. Splitting a task across two processors will incur a power overhead which can usually be reduced just by running it linearly on one chip. For the cost metric to be worth tracking, cheaper solutions should be harder to create, but the prices often won't reflect that. Take the harmonic maximizer as an example. The presence of three simple ports means a single microcontroller can't do the job, but rather than find a clever workaround, the cheapest solution is just to use a DX300 to convert one of the inputs to XBus. You would think using a component with three connectors just to move a single value would be cost inefficient, but in this case it's actually the best choice. It's impossible to provide an objective price list which would perfectly balance the difficulty for all components across all puzzles, but therein lies the problem. Despite these concerns, it could be said that the arbitrary values of Shenzhen are, in a sense, no different than the previous games. Block count is an objective number, but in some situations, even without the use of giant rotating arms, rotators would be more efficient for movement than conveyors. Even though they both count as one, their practical value changes on a puzzle-by-puzzle -puzzle basis. If, instead of a cost metric, Shenzhen simply listed the number of components, that would provide an objective measurement, but it would make some pieces vastly more valuable than others. Maybe Shenzhen's only problem is that prices intuitively seem less than ideal, not that they actually are. The near future presentation is one reason why optimizing for cost is still thoroughly enjoyable even though the price of each component was just made up. A space chem reactor is almost unimaginable to us, whereas you can easily picture yourself walking into a store and browsing for the cheapest or least power hungry version of some appliance. 
Infinifactory's textured blocks may have resembled actual items, and TIS may have tasked us with solving actual problems, but Shenzhen offers both at the same time. Not only do you get the satisfaction of creating a product with at least a veneer of real-world application, you even sometimes get to watch a custom visualization of it in action. These diagrams, as polished as they are, were never going to offer the exact same feeling of watching your fully player-created machine carrying out all of its complicated manoeuvres, but it's still a massive improvement on TIS's biggest flaw. Not to mention the deft touch of highlighting live wires which adds some much needed visual spark to the circuitry as well. While obviously it would be ideal if every puzzle featured a visual component, given limited developmental resources, Actronics have picked the most compelling ones to animate. It's hard to find any complaints here, except for the intersection signal which uses giant static arrows to represent traffic instead of little vehicles. A reasonable compromise, but a little disappointing all the same. Interestingly, with so much emphasis on visualizations, there's a complete lack of audioizations, assuming that's a word. A post-release update added a nifty synth generator, which is left unfortunately unused in the campaign. Insult to injury is the fact that one challenge actually does focus on sound, but is completely silent. Instead of the haunted doll, it's easy to imagine some kind of doorbell chime that could play one of two selected jingles in any of the various instruments. Presumably, Zektronics wanted to avoid redundant puzzles, but also wanted to avoid removing existing ones, especially if they have supplemental data sheets. It's a tough dilemma, but speaking as a player, I can say I would have loved to have an audio-based challenge, even if it replaced a puzzle I had already completed. You know what, I'm tired of working on this review, let's talk about card games instead. I don't know much about Solitaire, but I do know that Shenzhen's variant is a heavily modified version of Free Cell, only instead of the strict movement rules, it has a few other complications. Your standing on Shenzhen Solitaire will depend on how you feel about those rule changes, but for me at least it makes for a superior version. In regular Free Cell, the two black and red suits blend together, meaning you have to scrutinise the graphics to an uncomfortable degree. Shenzhen's focus on three different colours brings the simple but important benefit of making the entire board more easily readable. Interestingly, that also increases the complexity by allowing you to shuffle stacks around in creative ways to free up certain cards, as well as acting as a pitfall. You have to be careful not to build a large chain with only two suits, or you'll end up with an awkward surplus of the other one. There's a lot to consider. If you want to have a good success rate, you'll have to think several steps ahead, but freeing up the dragon cards is usually a clear goal to work towards. Basically, it's got a nice balance between depth and clarity, but more important than its individual quality is how well it complements the main event by allowing you to take a break from puzzles while still staying in-game. Almost like exactly what we're doing right now, what a coincidence. Although, I do have to wonder whether it was the best thing to give players a break from intense mental exercise by having them do light mental cardio instead. Maybe it would have made more sense to include some old-school game and watch style LCDs to shoot for high scores on. Sometimes when I take a break with Solitaire, I end up going back to the main game feeling just as mentally exhausted as before. Almost like exactly how I feel right now. What a coincidence. Alright, back to work. Visualizations are a welcome addition, but they inherit a flaw from Shenzhen's base mechanics. Here's my very first solution to the pollution sensing smart window. Now here's one that's nearly four times as efficient. If watching your solution come to life is reward for a job adequately done, then watching it get faster is the reward for optimization, or at least it used to be. Even the basic number crunching arrays of TIS could be sped up, but Shenzhen only shows the result of each time step. Given the choice between jerky, oddly paced animations that reflect optimization, or evenly spaced ones that reflect what's happening from a human perspective, Zaktronics have opted for the latter. There is no perfect solution, apart from perhaps allowing players to choose for themselves. While these games technically have no relation to each other, they all scratch a similar itch and there are some design choices in common across all four. Perhaps it's because computer games are still in their infancy as a medium, but the word sequel seems misused for games without a narrative focus. Their stories might be different, but in almost every other way that counts, Space Chem, Infinifactory, TIS and Shenzhen form a series. Leaping from visual programming to 3D factory design to stripped down assembly, it was easy to keep that series feeling fresh, but Shenzhen has so many similarities to TIS it posed a new problem. Zaktronics were almost certainly aware that having efficient and inefficient solutions both appear the same was a huge negative, but viewed in the larger context of the series as a whole, it could be seen as an acceptable trade-off. In the same way that they strive to avoid redundant puzzles within each campaign, the same could also be said of the entire games themselves. Granted, this particular quirk was also present in Cocktopa, but as far as Zaktronic's commercial releases go, Shenzhen provides something you can't get with the others, the challenge of having to output certain values on every single step. 
This conceit means that verification also has to work differently, even compared to TIS. Fortunately, the best features have been preserved. Edge cases are still usually presented early, and while randomised tests no longer seem to be present, the existence of 80 tests instead is probably even better since it makes state machines practically worthless. Overall, it's good news, but at times the way these test cases are implemented is unnecessarily restrictive, cutting off the potential for further optimization. For the cold storage robot, the arm movements are all strictly defined. It has to grab a container, store it, then move back to the default position. In the event that a container is stored, then immediately retrieved, this results in the arm unnecessarily moving up and down the track. A more efficient version of this device might only move the arm when necessary, resulting in slower storage times, but lower power usage and generally faster retrieval times. Ideally, rather than specifying what every single movement of the arm should be, the requirement should simply state that the arm be capable of retrieving or storing a container within a certain number of time units. Beyond that, the inner workings are probably of no concern to the end user. To be clear, moving the arm only when necessary would mean having to calculate each action from a relative position rather than an absolute one, raising the difficulty, not lowering it. The challenge for the most simple solution remains the same. More freedom just opens up the pursuit of better, more difficult optimizations. LCD screens actually do have this level of flexibility thanks to their unique behavior. For these, it doesn't matter what values are sent when, as long as the screen displays the right thing at the right time, it passes the test. Ideally, most puzzles would have maximized the player's freedom to optimize while preserving the base difficulty they have now. I include this criticism with a healthy dose of trepidation, as there's a chance some smartass will figure out an easy way to destroy the puzzle under my conditions. This fear is probably present for Zactronics as well. It would be ludicrous to expect them to know the exact possibility space for every challenge, which is probably why this issue exists in the first place. I suppose we can chalk this one up as a pitfall of making games that tempt engineers to break them as hard as possible. So far, the running theme for this review has been flaws that are easily excused if you view them a certain way, but that doesn't mean Shenzhen is exempt from any real issues. After the complete non-linearity of TIS, the return to a somewhat more linear style can be especially frustrating. Since the main campaign culminates with an important project from Sun Haoshan, the earlier Sun Haoshan projects all act as bottlenecks, ensuring the player has proved themselves beforehand. It would be fair to say that the game benefits greatly from the increased narrative context provided by the email chains attached to every single puzzle. Not only do they give a greater understanding of what each product is supposed to be, but they're often just entertaining in and of themselves. This approach is almost identical to the bonus campaign of Infinifactory, but additional entertaining dialogue is withheld until right after puzzle completion, turning it into an incentive. As if engaging puzzles, satisfying visual feedback, competitive histograms, leaderboards and narrative progress weren't enough of a driving force, now you're guaranteed some amusing dialogue as a reward as well. This approach to player motivation is scattershot, but all the more devastatingly effective because of it. If you're the type of person who doesn't care about the story, at least you have the histograms and vice versa. Best case scenario, you enjoy all of these features and get to experience them every single time. Still, as beneficial as it is to have a story tying everything together, it seems as though Zactronics have allowed it to take a greater priority than non-linearity rather than coexist with it. There'd be nothing incongruous about Sun hiring the player for a big project if they completed four out of five major ones so far. In fact, the second and third bonus worlds of Infinifactory worked that exact way. Linearity has its benefits. Kelp Harvesting Robot is not so much a difficulty spike as it is a difficulty space elevator to the moon, so I'm not sure I ever would have ploughed through it if I had the choice to go around. In that case, linearity pushed me beyond what I thought were my limits. Obviously this feels great after the fact, but at the time it was a source of less positive emotions. We're almost circling back around to this not being a flaw, but I think the key here is that difficulty doesn't have to be sacrificed for non-linearity, quite the opposite. If, instead of one kelp harvesting robot, there were three puzzles of equivalent difficulty, you'd still be forced to do something just as challenging, only without feeling trapped. Maybe the puzzles could be made even harder with the assumption that at least one of them will click with each particular player. Ideally, after leaving the tutorial, there should always be at least two puzzles available, especially considering how taxing these games can be at times. TIS benefit greatly by allowing you to walk away from a difficult challenge, complete something else instead, and come back to the other with a fresh mind. In Shenzhen, you'll have no choice but to press on through something you may not be enjoying anymore, or just give up altogether. The effort made to differentiate Shenzhen from TIS is admirable, but in some cases also feels like overkill. JRO is removed and conditional logic is revamped to work through predication instead. 
These two differences are extremely valuable because they substantially change how you need to think about logic and communication between chips, but Zaktronics have overcorrected and removed some other useful functionality like neg and swap as well. As I mentioned in the TIS video, programming under these unique constraints is the whole point, but sometimes Shenzhen suffers from a frustrating sense that the rules have been designed solely to make your life as difficult as possible. Dumping the data packet concept and the SLX command on the player at the same time could easily prove overwhelming, so the non-blocking XBus port represents a good compromise. There are some limited situations where a non-blocking input makes sense, but it's way overutilized in later puzzles, adding a minor hassle which is solved the exact same way every time. Move the value into the accumulator before testing it in case it's not minus 999, then decide what to do based on the outcome of that test. If you've finished the game yourself, I don't need to tell you how repetitive that can feel. Some individual puzzles suffer from an excess of hassle as well. For the electronic practice target, the most interesting part of the challenge is figuring out how to calculate the scores, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. A large amount of difficulty arises from the way the displays need to be refreshed for every step, then flashed at the end. At times it also feels as though chips have their ports placed in the worst possible arrangement, with simple pins at the top on the right side and bottom on the left. You're also given a vertical bridge, but not a horizontal one. Again, to be clear, some level of hassle is actually desirable, but if you look at similar constraints in TIS, they're a lot more easy to accept because of the way they're presented. You might find yourself wishing that a certain node could connect directly to five others, but it's well established that four is the maximum. That's just a limitation of the architecture. Conversely, it's totally reasonable to question why a simple bridge can't just be turned the other way instead. One area where these kinds of constraints and hassles aren't a flaw is the sandbox. While Infinifactory's sandbox was good because it was block-based and gave players a huge amount of space to build fun things with those blocks, Shenzhen's is enjoyable because it's the opposite. Programmers already have the near-infinite space they need to make interesting things. The enjoyment of Shenzhen's sandbox is seeing what can be accomplished under the constraints it imposes. The increased space and addition of larger memory chips makes it somewhat more freeform than the main game, but it's still relatively restrictive. In this area, at least, it strikes a nice balance. While Shenzhen does have some minor flaws, none of them get in the way of it seemingly wringing every last drop of potential out of its premise. Supplementary data sheets are each sourced from different clients with different tasks and styles of presentation. Custom visualizations for many puzzles address TIS's biggest failing. The late introduction of the Gen command is an intentionally frustrating moment you can look back on and laugh about. Solitaire is enjoyable in its own right and allows you to stay in game while simultaneously taking a much needed break. The soundtrack finally hits the sweet spot where each puzzle plays a different tune. The story once again presents some morally ambiguous situations, giving you a taste of real world ethical problems without being judgmental or preachy. This time around you can even decide to go a step further, the electronic door lock is crying out for terribly insecure solutions. An entire data sheet presented in Chinese challenges you to figure out the inner workings of a complicated component for yourself, unless you happen to speak Chinese, in which case ni hao. Several additional parts expand the sandbox mode, allowing it to flourish more than would be possible with just the basics. And on top of all the aforementioned features, there's Zaktronic staples like histograms, friend leaderboards, and custom puzzle creation. At this point, what more can you ask for lives up to its reputation as a rhetorical question. An underlying theme of Shenzhen is the economical shift that has occurred between China and America. It's true that Americans don't do as much manufacturing anymore, but hey, at least they still export some great games. In the next video, alchemy is the new chemistry, so I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.